Hey there everybody, Mr. Mark with you. In this video, we're discussing the idea of friction. Um, now physicists oftentimes act like they don't like fr friction. Um, they try to envision scenarios where friction doesn't exist. But as it turns out, in most situations, there is some friction, and that causes a complication to physicists. And so we say that this is the bane to physicists, but it's really helpful to everybody else. As it turns out, nothing in your world would really move or go anywhere if it weren't for friction. So it's kind of important from the shoes you wear, the tires on your cars, uh, for everyday life. Let's start with some basics. Friction is a force, if that's not clear from the context, that acts between two surfaces which are in contact with each other. So a real simple example, if you take your hands and press them together and then move them back and forth, you will see, or feel rather, the friction force between the two surfaces that are your hands. So first key word is surface, two surfaces in contact. Friction is always parallel to those surfaces um, and the position where they contact each other. And it opposes, oops, let's go back, the relative motion between the two surfaces. For that reason, we say that it is a resistive force. Another example of a resistive force would be air resistance or drag. Now, be careful with that idea that friction is resistive force. Notice it opposes the relative motion between the two surfaces, not that it opposes motion. That word relative is kind of important there. So friction does, in certain situations, cause things to speed up. One example would be your car. When you press the gas pedal, it is the friction between your tires and the ground that causes your car to go forward. If you're on ice, pressing the gas pedal will do nothing because there will be no friction to push you forward. So it's the relative motion between the two surfaces that friction opposes. So that's a couple of examples. Um, the first example, baseball player moving to the right and sliding to a stop. Anytime you see sliding, that would probably indicate that friction might be important. So if a baseball player is moving to the right and slowing down, that must mean that friction is acting to the left. Our next example, a runner who is running to the right. A person who is running is running and moving forward because of the force of friction between their feet and the ground. So in this situation, friction is probably going to the right, pushing them forward. Um, a box in a truck, which is speeding up to the right from a stop sign. Again, friction is what's keeping the truck, or the uh, box rather, from sliding off the truck, making it speed up to the right. So in that situation, friction would go to the right. And then the last example, um, the magnetic marker box that's on my whiteboard, you would think that it's held up by magnets, but all that the magnets really do is pull it inward. So that arrow to the right would be the magnets. Of course, there would be a normal force opposing that, and then the thing that holds it up is friction. So the whiteboard goes up and down. Friction, therefore, has to go up and down as well because it's parallel to the surface. Always keep that in mind when thinking about friction. It's parallel to the surface. So the size of friction, remember another fancy word for size is magnitude, depends on two things. Number one, the nature of the two surfaces basically how rough they are. The roughness of a surface that causes it to exert friction on other surfaces. Um, we can quantify that by a number that's referred to as the coefficient of friction, which we give the uh, symbol Greek letter mu, which is kind of like a U with a long tail on the front of it. Let me draw a mu bigger for you real quick. That's what a mu looks like. And so that's the coefficient of friction. That's basically a number that tells us how rough the two surfaces are. The higher that number is, the greater the friction force is going to be. So for something like tires and concrete, you want that number to be really high. Whereas for something like ice skates and an ice skating rink, you want that number to be really low. Um, each set of surfaces has a different coefficient of friction. And so when you buy different tires from the store, when you put new tires on your car, they're going to vary based on the coefficient of friction, how rough they are. And in our class, that's basically something that has to be measured, which we'll do in class later on um, this week. The second thing that determines the size of the friction force is the normal force that's pushing the two surfaces together. 
The higher the normal force is, the greater the friction force is going to be. So going back to the example of rubbing your hands together, the harder you push your hands together, the more friction force is going to be generated. And the harder it is to keep your hands moving, and the hotter they get as a result when you rub them together. Another good example of the normal force's effect on friction would be erasing something on a piece of paper with a pencil eraser. The harder you push down, the better it erases, because the more force you get. Uh, if you push down too hard, you can generate enough force to rip your paper, which may have happened to you at some point in the past. I know it's happened to me before. Now, friction comes into flavors. Um, when friction is, cause, is acting on something rather that is in motion, we refer to it as kinetic friction. And that word kinetic just means in motion. Um, so that happens when the two surfaces are moving relative to each other. You may also refer to that as sliding. So a baseball player sliding, that would be an example of kinetic friction. Kinetic friction always has magnitude that is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. That is always true about kinetic friction. And so anytime we see kinetic friction acting on an object, that's how we can figure out how big it is. So, for example, let's suppose that you're just dragging a 20 kilogram tire along the ground, concrete, um, at a constant velocity, and let's just suppose that the coefficient between those two surfaces is 0.5. How much force do we need to drag it at a constant velocity? So just like any other problem involving forces, the first thing we're going to do is draw a free body diagram. So this tire would have gravity pulling it down, normal force pushing up. You're pushing it to the right, let's call that FP, and so friction would be going to the left to oppose the motion between the tire and the concrete. The second thing we're always going to do is write some net force equations to relate the different forces on the object. Since this is moving at a constant velocity, we know that the sum of the forces has to be zero. And so in the x direction, that would be u pushing minus friction equals zero since they're balanced. And so the push force would have to equal the friction force. And then just to make sure that we know what's going on, I'm going to write subscript comma k for kinetic friction. And I can do the same thing in the y direction. Normal force minus gravity gives me the net force in the y direction. And again, that equals zero because the forces are balanced. So the normal force equals Fg, equals the weight. So I can find that by multiplying the mass by g. So multiplying 20 kilograms by 10 newtons per kilogram would give me a normal force of 200 newtons. Now the normal force is important because that's what's going to affect the force of friction. So my third step here is just to apply the relationship that kinetic friction equals mu times the normal force. Multiply my 0.5 by my 200 newtons. That should be 200. Which would give me a normal force of 100 newtons. And then, because the normal force has to equal the push force in this situation, we're pushing with a force of 100 newtons. And it's always good practice in physics to indicate the direction. That will be 100 newtons to the right. So be sure to indicate the direction. So that's a real simple example of kinetic friction. Now when the two surfaces are at rest relative to each other, we refer to that as static friction. This is a slightly more complicated situation. Um, and the reason it's more complicated is because it will vary depending on the other forces acting on it on the object. Um, basically, friction, static friction is lazy. It's only going to be as um, forceful as it needs to be in order to keep the object at rest. So we see the same relationship where the force of friction equals mu times the normal force, but it's important to note that that just gives us the maximum static friction force. In reality, it can be anything between zero and mu times the normal force. And so really the better way to express an equation form 
the force of static friction is that it's an inequality. Basically, it can vary between zero and some maximum value, which is given by the quantity mu, mu times the normal force. And so mu times the normal force gives you the maximum value that static friction could be. So in most situations involving static fr friction, we won't use that equation to figure out what's going on. We'll probably just use our free body diagrams and our net force equations. So let's work through a simple example. Let's suppose that we have the same tire and the same concrete surface. And we know that the coefficient of static friction between the tire and the concrete is 0.8. We want to know what happens in each of the following situations. We put 100 newtons of force on it to the right, 150 newtons of force on it to the right, and then 180 newtons of force to the right. So the first thing we might do is figure out how big static friction could be. So if we multiply mu times the normal force, 0.8 times 200 newtons, that would give us a maximum static friction force of 160 newtons. So that number tells us how large static friction could be, not how big it is. So let's compare that to the forces that are given to us. So in part A, if we put 100 newtons of force on the tire, 100 newtons of force is less than 160 newtons of force. So this thing's going to stay at rest. So if we draw a free body diagram to illustrate that, we have 100 newtons of force going to the right. Static friction is going to equal 100 newtons of force going to the left. Now it could be as big as 160, but it only has to be 100 newtons in size. And so in order to keep it at rest, it just has to exert 100 newtons of force to the left, so that's what it's going to do. In part B, we increase the friction force to, or excuse me, the applied force to 150 newtons, but that's still less than 160 newtons. And so our tire is still going to stay at rest. The only difference is that static friction has increased with the increase in that applied force. So it still stays at rest. The only difference is static friction is larger. Now it's 150 newtons directed to the left. In part C, we apply 180 newtons of force. Well, 180 newtons of force is bigger than 160 newtons of force. So that means that the tire is finally going to start to move. And since 180 newtons to the right is bigger than friction to the left, it's going to move to the right and it's going to speed up. And then we're going to be in the realm of kinetic friction because it's moving and the whole static friction stuff goes away. So the thing that we have to realize, and this is kind of something that gets missed a lot, is that this number right here doesn't tell us how big static friction is. It tells us how big it could be. We have to figure out from the context what the actual force is. So that's where our free body diagrams, net force equations come into play. In general, the static coefficient of friction between two surfaces is greater than the kinetic coefficient of friction. Basically, it's easier to keep something moving than it is to get something moving from rest. Um, so that's just kind of a general rule we need to remember. Let's look at one more example together. In the diagram shown below, you've got a 4 kilogram box that's at rest on a level surface. You've got two springs attached to it. Um, you're told the coefficient of static and kinetic friction between the box and the surface. You're told that the spring on the left exerts 20 newtons of force to the left, and then the spring on the right exerts a, or excuse me, has a spring constant of 500 newtons per meter, and it stretched 5 centimeters to the right. And we want to figure out the direction that static friction acts on the box. So you look at all this stuff and you're like, the answer is a direction. It doesn't really look like I have to do any work. Like, I shouldn't have to draw any equations or write down an equal sign or do any multiplying or adding or anything like that. But in fact, we do. Basically, what we need to do is figure out which of those two forces is bigger so we can figure out what direction the missing static friction force is in. So we're told we have 20 newtons of force acting on this thing to the left. So I'm just going to kind of draw that on there, kind of sketch out a free body diagram. And then I'm told that the other spring exerts, um, well, it doesn't tell me the force that it exerts, but I can use Hooke's Law to figure out how much force it exerts. So if I take the 500 newtons per meter and multiply by 0.05 meters, I would get a force of 25 newtons. 
So do a little bit of work, that lets me compare the forces that are already acting on it, like the 25 is bigger than the 20. I know that the forces have to be balanced in order for this thing to stay at rest. So that means I need a force of 5 newtons to the left in order to make those things add up to zero. So that force to the left must be the static friction force. So you might be going, well, what happens with the mu times the normal force equation? Because it gives you a mu in the prompt. Um, so why isn't the static friction force 30 newtons? Again, that thing gives us the maximum value for the static friction force, not what it actually is. So for instance, if I increase the force going to the right, then the static friction force would increase. It's got to balance them out. If I increase the force going to the left, then the static friction force would decrease because it wouldn't have to exert as much force in order to keep the object at rest. If both of those springs were exerting 25 newtons of force, then the static friction force would be zero. It wouldn't have to exert any force in order to keep the things at rest. So that's kind of the important distinction about static friction. It's only going to be as big as it needs to be in order for the object to stay at rest. <coughs> Excuse me. So, let's kind of summarize real quick. These are the things we need to be able to do in regards to friction. Explain the factors that affect the friction force. Determine the direction of the friction force based on the context, free body diagrams, the other forces, and things like that. Calculate the magnitude of the friction force. And then lastly, and this is probably most important, distinguish between static and kinetic friction. What are their similarities? What are their differences? And so we will work on doing that in class next time. We will measure these coefficients, try to figure out how we can do that, um, and then work on putting this into context with some more complicated examples. So until I see you then, ta-ta.